On a day like thousands of others, Diana, Princess of Wales, came out of her palace to see and be seen. It was a ritual, a formula, an unchanging routine. And what made it so special was her sense of style and fashion, her warmth and kindness. This was her role, her work, the reason for her inimitable performance and the cause of the overwhelming media attention that claimed her as its own. If ever she doubted the sense of it all, she found her answer in the happiness she gave the sick and afflicted. But a year after her divorce and the loss of the title Her Royal Highness, Diana was ready to leave all this behind. The catalyst was Dodi Al-Fayed, 42-year-old playboy son of Harrods owner Mohammed Al-Fayed. Diana, as a guest of the Al-Fayed family aboard their luxurious yacht, the Johnny Curl, had fallen in love with Dodi. And she said, Elsa, I adore him, not even naming him. I adore him. I can't tell you, for the first time in my life, someone has looked after me so wonderfully. I feel that he's interested in me. I feel, I can't tell you how good they are to me, to my morale. I mean, she was enthusiastic. I said, are you going to marry him? She said, I can't answer you as I'm coming to see you, either Thursday or Saturday. Saturday she was dead. For 15 years, Diana lived in Kensington Palace. With mostly just her staff for company, she had tried to create a family home. She surrounded herself with mementos of her Spencer family ancestry, her fabled but flawed marriage, and above all, of her two precious sons, constant reminders of her broken dreams. I think they were instrumental, um, especially at the time of the separation and the divorce. I think as all children do, not wanting to alienate either side, and okay, in some respects they were slightly the go-betweens, and yet um, they always were very careful not to upset Diana by mentioning things they knew would upset her, and they always said, Daddy loves you. Charles was truly her Prince Charming. She, he was the one that um, she was always in reference to throughout her life, even towards the end. Even any other relationship would always be kind of compared to or contrasted with her relationship with Charles. He was her reference point. Diana and Charles shared the custody of the boys, and in July 1997, she took them on holiday with Dodie's family aboard the Jonical. Following her divorce, Diana's life centered around her sons. But the children, don't forget, she took them on the boat, and they had a wonderful time. Not probably William. William was not so happy, but the little one was thrilled all the games, all the things. And it was probably to accustom them to the situation. And when I asked her, are you going to marry him? And what your children reaction? She said, Elsa, I rang up William. So it was the answer. And he said, mommy, I want you to be happy. Diana would have never married Dodie without the consentment of the two children and Prince William more than that because she always said that Prince William was her anchor and she admired the boy enormously and she loved she loved the other one very much Prince Harry but she always said Prince Harry is, a, uh, is like a Spencer I don't have worries about him but uh, I think that the, the future king Prince William has the sense and sensibility of Diana as heir to the throne, William and his brother Harry carry with them the traditions of the Royal House of Windsor. Diana knew that any stepfather would have a very delicate role to fill. She also recognised that her sons were very much part of the Windsor household. Um, I'm sure she wouldn't have married somebody that they absolutely detested, but um, I think she would have done her best to sort of bridge any gaps and she had already mentioned to me that she thought the Al-Fayed family provided rather a nice context for William and Harry, that there was this sense of family and sense of warmth and that um, Mohammed Al-Fayed was quite fatherly towards them. 
In the early years of family life, Diana felt at home in the country. When her marriage broke up, she lost the country home Highgrove and the family life that had been her childhood ambition. Like their mother, William and Harry became products of a broken home. Diana compensated by taking a dominant role in her children's lives. She was concerned about the role of monarchy, about the paparazzi and how that might disturb her boys. And she was also very concerned that they weren't going to grow up spoiled or sort of too much within that tradition. And she used to love taking them to see, you know, the homeless and wear the jeans and just, you know, go down to brass tacks. I mean, she was terribly concerned that they should see that side of life. And she drummed into them the most amazing good manners, which she herself had, absolutely impeccable, um, which is just such an asset and something I think she found rather lacking within the royal family. Following her unhappy experiences within the royal family, Diana shaped the boys in her own image and likeness. In the words of her brother, Earl Spencer, Diana wanted their souls to sing freely. She would really want them to lean on each other and to remember as well together the times they had with their mother. With her sons away at boarding school, Diana had to fill many long and lonely hours at Kensington Palace. Her friend was the telephone, and she really did have the hotline to all and sundry. Diana regularly invited friends to lunch, often greeting them herself in the forecourt. Security and protocol prevented people from just dropping in. Isolated by her position as a princess, people came by invitation only to dine at Kensington Palace. The food there, as I said, was both beautiful, delicious, and incredibly healthy. Um, I can remember one summer, um, there was sort of like an orange sorbet with the beautiful nasturtium flowers all around the outside of these crystal plates. She always had stunning flowers on the table, of course. And the food, um, lots of souffles, cheese souffles, spinach souffles, um, chocolate souffles, sometimes very naughty ones. <laughs> but um, mainly, um, it was sort of elegant food that she liked. I remember also once asking her if, if she could choose a single item, if she sort of was locked away or sort of cast aside on a desert island, what would she take with her? And she said, oh, my juicer, she said immediately. And I thought, what a strange thing to say. And then she went into the whole business of, you know, look at this, you know, we can have 20 cucumbers blended down into this thing and it's fantastic for your skin. And her skin was absolutely terrific, so it obviously worked, but that's the thing she swore by. Diana's day began at dawn. She slept badly. After many restless nights, she relied on exercise to face the pressures ahead. Before most people had arrived at work, Diana had already driven the short distance from Kensington Palace to Buckingham Palace to swim 20 lengths in the private pool there. Then it was on to the gym for a strenuous workout, often with a personal trainer. In a quest for maximum fitness, she experimented with many exercise techniques. Health was um, something which fascinated her all her life. She adored swimming. She was a real fish. And she said that really relaxed her. She was an absolute fiend for the gym. But she said that gave her energy. To begin with, also, she you know, played a lot of tennis, which she said got rid of her anger when she was feeling very frustrated. So she recognized that exercise was terribly important for sort of releasing her feelings in a way. Those feelings arose from the broken promises and the betrayal of her youth. At 19, as Lady Diana Spencer, she had no idea of the way ahead. Marriage to Prince Charles was the culmination of her teenage dreams. She was to be the Princess of Wales and future Queen of England.